We're coming into the last 50 metres. Pushpure out in front. She's going to take the gold medal. Lobning looking good for silver. And Kiridu has pushed ahead and is now in, in bronze medal position. It's the last few strokes here. Sanita Pushpure is going to take the gold medal ahead of Austria's Lobnig for silver. And look at this. The young athlete from Greece, Aneta Kiridu, takes the bronze ahead of Udvi Eriksson. Resigned to fourth. And then fifth place, Janine Gmelin, ahead of sixth place, Pia Greiten for Germany. What a performance from the double world and now double European champion, Sanita Pushpure. Yes, well, as you can hear, congratulations are in order. Sanita Pushpore, now a double European champion as well as a double world champion. She defended her single schools title at the European Rowing Championships in Poland over the weekend. And we are very happy to say she is with us now. Sanita, congratulations. Thanks very much. Have you been relaxing over the last couple of days, enjoying your gold medal, or is it back training? Uh, I've been relaxing for the last few days, yes. We have an easy enough week now, and then um, back to training on Monday. Good. Feet up, bring me my tea, bring no. me my chocolate, I'm relaxing. <laughs> yes, exactly. It is bring me everything, because we're not allowed to really go to the shops or anything, so we're self-isolating now. Okay. What were your expectations going into the regatta? I know you took three months off during the summer and maybe had about seven weeks worth of training behind you before the weekend. What were you expecting? Uh, nothing much, if I'm honest. Um, I really enjoyed my three weeks break during the summer because I felt like the lockdown period was so taxing. It was really good to do absolutely nothing for three weeks. And then, um, yeah, when we started training, it was like interesting because we knew we only had like six or seven weeks until Europeans and um, yeah but looks like we did good training so it really paid off but uh, definitely didn't have expectations to win uh, I was actually freaking out I thought like at some point I didn't want to go because I didn't want to be beaten but then I thought like not racing for a year that's a long time and then I'll just go to get kind of get that feel for racing again and feel those nerves and remember how nervous I'm going to be because mm. uh, otherwise that would be a year and a half before we race again so I'm glad we did I did go yeah who do you talk to when you're nervous or you're thinking about not going everyone <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll be talking to my psychologist my coach my friends like everyone who's listening I'll be talking but it's kind of good to talk it out because then some people will talk sense back into you and show the other side of it. You can't, uh, like, you can't have a massive expectation on your shoulders when you're only training for like six or seven weeks. So, yeah, it was kind of good to take on that challenge and race after such a short time of training. And and did anybody turn around and say, "We told you you'd win"? <laughs> uh, no, not quite, because. Um, up until the last race, I didn't think I will, to be honest, because uh, the first few rounds didn't go as well as I would want to. But I think I was quite conservative as well, because uh, the conditions were quite challenging. It, it was quite windy in Poznan. And uh, on the last race, I just got a little bit, not angry, but kind of, I felt that racing mojo a little bit more and was a little bit more competitive. And I think seeing the other crews coming off the water with medals around their neck. I was like, I want that as well. Mm. So, and then because we've been doing the same training, I thought, well, there's probably no reason why I wouldn't be able to do it. And um, yeah, and I'm kind of glad I went for it. Yes, I'm and, sure you are. It, yeah. mu it, it must be a lovely thing for all of you out there when you see your fellow Irish uh, colleagues doing very well, where you think to yourself, okay, well, I'm at a similar pitch to them, so if they're having some success, I'm not too far away. That must be lovely for all of you out there. Yeah, it's quite reassuring, and usually the schedule kind of plays in my favor, so I race after them, so I can see how everybody else is doing, and I'll be like, oh yeah, they're okay, so I'll be fine too. Hmm. Um, so it's kind of nice, gives me, definitely gives me reassurance before the race. I was reading that the race, your race, your final, it was a fast, pace was it faster than you would have wanted and and why does a race take on a fast pace is it that somebody decides to go hell for leather and then everybody else has to stay with them uh, i actually when i said fast i didn't mean fast as conditions or time but i meant it went fast as uh it felt really fast when kind of the 2k felt really short okay 
just because I was so focused and uh, I was in a good spot and all, at all times I, was, I didn't have to fight from the back. Sometimes when you're losing, the race can feel much, much longer. So it just felt like it was over in, in a flash and that was kind of nice. So you like to lead from the front or be pretty close to the front across a race? Uh, well, I had a fast starting uh, Austrian on my left side and very fast starting Danish girl on my right side. So my plan was to stick with them. And I knew if I'm with them with 500 meters gone and then I'll be sorted. Like I won't fall back. Sometimes if they start too fast, I'll have to kind of slowly work my way back to the top. And that takes extra energy as well. Yes. So I use I use them to pull me forward pretty much. And So you feel if you're there or thereabouts, maybe halfway through a race, you have a strong finish? Yeah, well, I could and couldn't sometimes, I suppose. Um, but I think it's important to stay in touch during a race. Because I've had so many races when I lose touch, like you don't see the crews around you and then you have to try to pace back. So once you have that contact with the other crews, like you're overlapping, it's mentally much easier to keep pushing on and stay with them instead of having nobody around and then chasing them. Mm. Um, yeah, I much prefer that or just leading from the front and watching everybody. I suppose that that's even better. <laughs> we'll work on that. <laughs> you said that you found the lockdown period very taxing. In what ways? Uh, mentally, of course, because uh, we're so used to competitive environment in training, we push each other on all the time. So it was really kind of challenging to be on your own, try to do the best you can. And uh, especially knowing that there will be no Olympics at the end of it. So um, once we got back together, it was much easier. But that was kind of June, I think, when we started training together again. So the, those few months, March, every May, was quite difficult. Mm. And were you able to train on your own during that period or was it total stop? No, we did actually train. I actually didn't miss any sessions during that time. Uh, it just that they were mentally so much harder. It, it took so much more energy just to put on a gear and go and do the session instead of just, you know, bouncing onto the roof and like, yeah bring it you know mm. it was kind of like okay i have to go and i have to do it i did it but i did not enjoy it okay because so. i know you're you you train out at the national rowing center in farron woods yeah. yeah okay so you've got other people there so is it you just feed off each other's energy there's a bit of fun there's some laughter there's a bit of competition all of that stuff is what gets you through it then yeah exactly all all, all that you mentioned is there and and you're training in your environment, you're on the water. So it's like machine is really tough. It's not the same. It's much more enjoyable being on a water in the fresh air and uh, feeling the boat. And you can work on technical bits as on the erg. It's just pure power and grit. Like there's no vanesse on it. Yeah. You can work on the technique, but like if you're looking for a number, you can get number rowing badly. And uh, when we got back on the water in June, I felt I was I lost a bit of that Vanessa technically, uh, so and it took me quite a while. I don't actually think I got it back until we broke, uh, went for holidays. So, yeah, still lots of work to be done to, to get it back. Okay, that's very interesting. So on the machines in the gym, technique is not as important as when you're on the water. So I presume when you walk through gyms and see people like me on the rowing machines, you shake your head in disgust. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, no, well, it is important. We do try to row the same way, but if you see, you know, the rowing machine in a gym, it's very static. So when you get to the front stops, you only move the seat and the handle. As when you're in a boat, the boat moves underneath you. So it's a very different feeling. Um, we still try to do the same technical principle on a rowing machine as well, because obviously the better the, you row, the better the numbers will be. But sometimes when you're tired, you can... You can be opening your back way too early and still get a good number instead of kind of blocking your hips at the front and trying to get that number that way. So it's it's a small small things like you know when you're looking for the one two percent gain that's where you find it. So yes, I'm sure, yeah. Just to remind people of your story, I know you moved to Ireland in about two thousand and six, Sunita. At that stage, you had in Latvia. Uh, be, been into rowing as a junior, but I think around the time of your marriage, around 04 or so, a couple of years before you moved here, you'd given it up, you were done with rowing, you thought? 
yes, I was totally finished with rowing and I never had a thought of going back and doing it again. Uh, just when we moved to Ireland in 2006, um, even then, up until 2007 in autumn when we discovered Island Bridge by accident, only then I was like, oh yeah, I'll just go back rowing when I was still pregnant with a second child. So I had to wait until Daniela was born to get back in the boat. And even then, at the first, first a little while, it was just for a bit of a socializing with other people and a bit of a peace and quiet from little kids, like babies, pretty much. And uh, it was kind of time to myself. And then pretty fast, it kind of took over and the ambitions grew and uh, wanted to get more out of it. Okay. I used to live near that stretch of water in Island Bridge. Yeah. So it's where the UCD rowing yes. school is all there. Okay, so you were just out for a walk, is it, with your, with your husband and you saw it and you thought, I might go back to that? Uh, we were on the way to the zoo. My friend was over visiting at the time and we were going to the zoo from the city and we missed that turn to Phoenix Park and went straight to Island Bridge. And uh, at the time it was a peak training time as well, I think, and we saw a lot of boats in the water. And that was it. So the switch was flicked and just had to wait for the baby to be born to get on the water, <laughs> which was another, what, um, three, four, four months, four or five months. Yeah. I get. I guess though. So, but she, it's it's amazing that. Well, it's 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 magic. Gave up something you loved, I guess. But then, when you resume doing it, to think it's going to take you to two and hopefully three Olympic Games. That's just a bit nuts, isn't it? Yeah, it is a bit crazy, and the years have flown by so fast as well. It seems like I just started doing it, and then here we are. Like, uh, you know, when yeah. you when you when you went back and started doing it. Uh, pretty quickly do you realize, hang on, I'm, I'm good at this. You know, how do, how do you go from just uh, socializing and taking a break from the kids to competing for Ireland? Yeah, I'm just very competitive by nature, I think. And once I started getting on the water, I just wanted to be faster and faster all the time. And uh, then there was an opportunity to go in a double with the girls from the club. And just like step by step and i think by the summer that year i knew i want to do i want to go back to international rowing so and then i was a bit more motivated to go out and do like two sessions a day and um, training a little bit more get out in the boat a little bit more often and yeah it was just i think it, it was even before i don't know i guess I remember myself running with really useless and scaries at the time, running on a beach and uh, thinking that one day I'll I'll get the Irish passport and I'll go to Olympics. But I I wasn't even that good at the time. I was just <laughs> good at dreaming, I suppose, and that was it. Um, well, you got to dream first, I guess. That's the the first part of it. And so was your, yeah, your your husband and you got the two kids, that's, you know, you're in a new country or a sort of new country and families are back home. So in terms of juggling all of that or having a support network and everything, that must take a bit of a toll on the family or has it been okay? It was a bit crazy if you think of it now. Uh, I mean, there were times when we used to say hi and bye at the door switching, <laughs> I'll go I'll be back, let's say, minding kids and then at home minding kids and then Cass will come back from work and I'll go, after he's in, I'll be out the door going training in the gym. Um, I had my mom living with us for about a year and a half while I was working uh, with Tennis Island. And, uh, but then she went back to Latvia and that's where, that's when it got harder. Uh, yeah, so somehow we just juggle it all I don't even know how to be honest. <laughs> it definitely wasn't easy. I mean, I was up at five o'clock in the morning, going to Blessington, getting my two sessions done, then going back and working for, again, I used to work with Tennis Island there, doing summer camps. And I remember constantly being so tired, like, and yeah. never had time to stop, never even had time to eat properly, <laughs> my, like, for the naps and stuff. So. Yeah, it was pretty challenging, but I had so much motivation that it, like, it didn't never occur to me that it's too much what we're doing. So yeah, do you miss Latvia? Do you miss home? Are you are you happy with your move to Ireland? I mean, it's obviously worked out for you from a sporting perspective. 
yeah i'm i do like it here um despite the weather <laughs> but uh yes no i i love it here and yeah of course you do miss home especially like when something happens and, and you can be there for for them and mm. miss my friends but i have friends here now too and and i think rowing also helped me to integrate in society a little bit more so i found it felt like i found my place with the rowing in the country so it kind of felt that i belonged somewhere um so in that sense it was uh rowing was kind of a very positive thing happening too yes i can imagine it's one of yeah. the amazing things about sport isn't it be it language yes. or nationality i mean you get in your boat i get in my boat away we go you know that's how it goes yeah. so look hopefully there's a third olympics and i get the sense you know you, you've had so much success uh, double european champion now double world champion there is a degree of unfinished business with the olympics london was your first games i was reading about rio you missed out in the final by 0.65 of a second. It seems like you had the semi-final from hell, you know, lots of brilliant rowers around you and the water was choppy, yeah. so times weren't as good as they might otherwise have been. And so Tokyo, I, I can imagine uh, how, how big this is for you almost to put the, the, the final touch on, on your career and to sign off maybe the way you want to sign off. Yes, it's been a long time coming and now <laughs> it's even longer. Yeah. Um, yeah i mean the the first olympics was so magical i mean just getting there after having kids only four years ago you know four years after having kids mm. it was just it was remarkable really because i had i didn't have that fitness that i have now i didn't train as hard as i'm training now i i trained to my capacity but i was i was probably not able to train anymore mm. but uh thinking back now i think it has been insane how i got there and and again, on a paper, I shouldn't have made the Olympics, but somehow that dreaming paid off at the end because like, it, it just felt all or nothing. And if I wouldn't have qualified, I don't think if the, that there would have been second Olympics. Um, okay. Like I, I wouldn't have stayed, I think, because it was too taxing on a family and um, it just, it would be too devastating. Uh, but when I qualified, it just felt like, okay, it's worth it to keep going. And then obviously for Rio had amazing plans, like coming back home with the medal and everything, but it didn't quite work that way. Um, yeah. So fingers crossed to just like, keep this train going and training's going well. And hopefully the COVID stays away from, stays away from us as well. So mm. fingers crossed all goes to plan. OK, well, listen, we'll keep our fingers crossed for you as well. Hopefully Tokyo happens and, and you sign off the way you want to sign off. But congratulations in the meantime. I mean, seven weeks training, go out and win a European gold is a brilliant achievement. And your dedication is obvious to everybody over, what, the last decade and beyond. So, Sunita Pushpore, thanks so much. Thanks. Congratulations again. Enjoy the, the win and, and best of luck with the training over the next couple of months. Thanks very much for having me.